All right, we will start with the news that has shocked the auction houses of the world in the last few days, and that is that a man who is unnamed by the auction houses but has been named by the Trade Daily, the Racing Post, as the owner of the Derby winner authorised Sally al Hamazi, has bought, through bloodstock agent Richard Knight, millions of pounds worth of bloodstock that he now cannot pay for, and as such, Tattersall's the only auction company that has officially acted on this, have issued notices to all potential purchasers that these horses are now to go back on the market. The vendors of all those yearlings have been paid out, so they have not lost out, but still, this raises important questions about what's happened here, the process of the auction, and uh, what, we should, what we should take from this. Maddie Player, what do you think? Yeah, I just think it reflects really poorly uh, on the bloodstock industry as a whole. You know, this this lack of transparency um, and this is a huge amount of money. And we're talking reaching across the globe as well. You know, this is not just in Britain. This is at Keeneland, um, a huge sum. And if you were to say this to someone outside of horse racing, oh, will someone manage to spend that amount of money uh, and then suddenly the horses haven't been paid for? Uh, I just think it, it, it reflects badly and of course it means that the, the sales results in themselves were false. Um, you know, this in theory would have been driving up the prices and the averages. Uh, I feel badly for the people who have produced those horses um, because now they're going to be at a totally different stage in their development when they resell. And I just think we need more transparency uh, and we need to tighten up those processes so that this doesn't happen again. So auction houses, although most of them haven't commented, they, as I understand it, Charlie, will have offered or, or agreed a credit line sometime in advance. It's not as though some guy's just come in and started sticking his hand up and they've gone, yeah, absolutely fine. You do need to express the fact you're going to spend and spend big and they will then conduct the checks on you to see that to see that you are someone who is likely to pay for that and you've got someone who has bought and sold a lot of bloodstock in the past so it's a pretty unfortunate set of circumstances is it something that can be stopped in any way could we do anything about it will it? be interesting to see if you know, if tattersalls do move the goalposts um in future yeah whether this this event will will th make them rethink you know when people are going to be spending these kind of volumes they've obviously established that there's a line of credit open. They obviously haven't established that the credit is there. Um, will they need to in future have have the money in the bank <laughs> before they allow them to? But can they do that? I, Could you do that? If somebody said to you, right, so so say you're buying, you want to buy 40, 50 yearlings from book one and spend, I don't know, how much would you spend on book one normally? Us personally, yeah. well, we probably buy 15 at an average of 50. Um, so seven fifty. That's that's a lot of money. But would you would if they said to you, right, we're not going to do that unless you put your seven fifty in the in the bank on deposit now. If we if we were going to buy a horse for an owner that we knew nothing about, and we weren't certain of their ability to buy that horse, mm -hmm. we would tell them to put the money behind the bar first. Is um, now not the time to start naming clients as well? Would that help? with these processes. You know, is there any reason really why someone, an agent can put their hand up for a, a million pound horse and we have no idea who sold it or who it's going to? Well, I would say as a buyer, you're entitled to your anonymity. As a vendor, the buyer should know who's selling the horse. Yeah. That would be the way I would look at it, wouldn't you? I mean, I think transparency is who's selling the horse. Everyone should know who's selling the horse. But I think you're entitled to anonymity as a buyer, aren't you? Aren't you? Or not? Yeah, I think you well. It's difficult and <laughs> difficult to argue the toss in this situation, isn't it? But but I guess would if we'd known if we'd known the client, would that have changed this situation? Probably not. Mm. Um, it might have actually made you think. Well, yeah, he's good for his he's, money because yeah, exactly, he's only a yeah. derby winner. Yeah. But at least everyone would know where they stand. Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing here is um, I, I I can only only speak as I I have encountered the agent in question, Richard Knight, a few times. And uh, I, I do feel some sympathy with him. Well, he's I mean, a business it, this, partner I mean, in this as well. Yeah, I mean, he's it's not but, just an it, it's had a major It's had a major impact on, on his business. I mean, he presumably thinks this guy's good for his money. Yeah, I'm sure it'll be very tough for him, who actually had a, had a runner for one of his other clients last night and I just WhatsApped him post-race. Um, you know, we've, we've always gotten really well with Richard and 
um, found him someone very, very straight and honest to, to deal with in his role as a racing manager for, for Mr. Luter. Um, yeah, this will be very, very tough for him because albeit it's not him that will have, you know, it's not his funds that haven't come up, but he's the, he's the fall guy to an extent. He's the name that's in the, in the paper. Yes, I suppose that's what you mean, isn't it? That he's having to take the hit for something that's effectively not his, not his fault. Yeah, and of course we're going to see these horses sell. Um, those letters were sent out to prospective buyers. I mean, it's just a totally different scenario, isn't it? I mean, they've been in pre-training. Um, who's paying the pre-trainer? Um, well, Tattersalls presumably yeah, are now, because they are, they are re-offering the horses. They would have been paying Adam Kirby, I presume. Absolutely, yeah. So um, it will be interesting to see what happens to them, because we're talking about real high-class bloodstock mm. here. Um, and, you know, a lot of well-related horses who were probably likely to have successful careers on track. There is a possibility as we move on of course that Sally al Hamezi, if indeed it is him, he has been named by the Racing Post, it, he can, he has got until tomorrow to, to, to buy the horses by the, by the final deadline so it may well be that this spurs him into, into finding the money but the, the likelihood is of course that these will all find uh, other homes presumably at um, either significantly reduced prices or somewhere around the, the last bid before they were bought. Um, Tickets for the Lingfield Winter Million have been on sale, um, Maddie, for a tenner. Is that Is 20? 20, 20 quid. 20, 20 quid for three for days. Three day for three pack. days, sorry, yeah. yeah. So that's so what I mean. Less than a tenner a day. It's 20 quid for three days. Exceptional value. Um, I found myself at quite a few Lingfield meetings of late. And uh, yeah, I think for such high class racing, you know, we've seen top class horses um, at last year's meeting. Uh, you've got variety there with the, the flat racing as well. Um, and in a time of the cost of living crisis, everyone's tightening their belts. There's a lot of negative energy in the sport about, you know, customers getting value for money. Uh, this is a positive story. We should be talking about it well then, Lingfield. And um, yeah, it's going to be going to be a great event. Um, Lily, you were saying a lot of your friends aren't immersed in racing, but I'm sure they like to go. Some of them, particularly when when you're riding, how much do you think is fair to 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 get in for a day out? Oh, I think it's great, you know, Lingfield is, um, especially with the, this meeting, you know, it's quite a big meeting and I feel that, you know, the price of tickets is brilliant and yeah, no, I will be taking uh, one or a few of my friends to come with me um, if I've got a ride there and I, I, I do think it's really fa like fair for money and uh, no, well done Lingfield. Do you do that quite a bit? Do you do you do your friends come and support you quite a yeah, bit? Yeah, they do. Um, yeah, my friends that are outside of racing, they really do enjoy coming racing and watching me. So it's quite nice. And you don't feel any kind of like pressure having to look after them, and you concentrate on the job. You just let them get on with it. And yeah, let them get on with it. They do their own little thing, and um, no, they really enjoy it. To be honest. Do you think you've converted a few? I'd say so. Yeah, they enjoy coming to Cheltenham. Actually, um, two of my really really good friends were there at Cheltenham on um, on New Year's Day, so that was nice. Twenty pounds for three days of the Lingfield Winter Millions. Um, let's talk about veterans chases as a concept. We had the final of the veterans series yesterday. Uh, you have to be past your 10th birthday to run in them. And yesterday you had to be past your 11th birthday, didn't you, to, to run in the race at Sandown? You did, because it's uh, the beginning of the so. year. Mm. I'm sure you did. Um, you've ridden in lots of them. What do you think they are doing for the sport? I think they're great for people you know, watching the sport, they may be not involved. I think it's good to, for them to see the old old boys, you know, going and um, going and enjoying their racing. And it's just, I think it it opens a lot of opportunities for um, you know the public to see that these horses are still being, you know, still having a great time racing and enjoying it. And uh, I just think it's nice to see the old horses that you know once upon a time were very very good to go, you know, and have a chance. In, 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 in the veteran series, um, I think it's great. Slightly different rhythm of race when you're riding in those or not? Yeah, I think it's a little bit fairer. Apart from you're making the running. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a bit fairer, you know, it's not as fast and furious as, you know, once, one, as races that they've once run in. Um, it's a little bit nicer on them and uh, I, I personally love riding in those races. Mm -hmm. You know you're partnered with a lovely old boy that's going to, you know, you're going to have a great fun on um, and uh, I, I, think, I think they're very important. Charlie, veterans races on the flat? You know, six-year-old geldings and above. I think there is one, or isn't there? Or um, there might be. Yeah, there's. There, I'm sure there is. There's a few races that are restricted to six and above, but I, I don't think there is the. <laughs> there's not the horse population there for. for Look at old Duke races. of Friends. He retired during the week, didn't he? Yeah. He's been going on for a good while.
Yeah. I know, there, and there is, there'll be plenty of horses running on the old weather at the moment that are mm. approaching double digits in, in age, but I guess the difference is that there aren't, there aren't horses there at a high level at that no. age. And, and there are actually jumping, they're actually yeah, still exactly. at a, I think still that, at a that's, good level. Yeah, exactly, and I think that's why these, ho these races garner a following, because yes, they're veterans, but they're also still veterans running to 140, 150. Mm. There aren't flat horses at that age still running to 90 plus. I think it helps with the program as well. You know, if these races didn't exist, the horses would be running in open conditions. They wouldn't have the same chance to win. Um, but equally, it's fair. It's competitive racing. I've yet to speak to anyone who doesn't like them. A lot of the public love it. You know, the public eye to see the old horses. It's, it, 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 I think it's great. Let's switch codes again, back to the flat. Grace McEntee, um, who has been making a, a good name for herself in the UK, is likely to make an even bigger name for herself in the US, where she's trying to take advantage of greater opportunities, and indeed has so already, with some family connections at Turfway Park in, in northern Kentucky. We've talked about equine talent drain. Is there, a, is there a danger of a human talent drain as well, Maddie, or, or not? Or am I making too much of that? No. Lots of jockeys going abroad at the moment. Yeah, I mean... Before Christmas, I was in Hong Kong. Harry Bentley was there, and I was sort of joking, saying, "Well, this is a lot different from Wolverhampton on a Thursday night or whatever." And uh, mm. but in Grace's case, I mean, absolutely power to her for having a go. Jane Elliott, we've seen in a similar situation, and a lot of the lads as well. The prize money is so good. I think um, I was speaking to Phil McEntee, uh at Lingfield about the, the sort of motivation behind the move, and it, it's just prize money. You was know, it, was it you that wrote the piece where the headline was McEntee blasts pathetic prize money or something? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, me. yeah. Um, yeah good, bit, good bit of clickbait. Hey, <laughs> uh, but no, Phil was understandably very, uh, very animated about it because you've got a, a talented rider, an up-and-coming rider like Grace, who can earn, I think the one the quotes was thrown around, more in one meeting than she would do in an awfully long time over there compared to over here. So as much as I don't think this is a necessarily a huge thing, of course, it's still having an impact. And when you've got prize money like that on the table and you're at the age she is with the opportunity she is, it seems like a no brainer, really. So best of luck to her. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a very good point. And the other thing that struck me, Lily, was if you're based at a track in the states, there you are in situ, eight nine rides a day, and you don't have to get you don't have to get in the car. I think yeah, yeah exactly. She won't be driving far to get to the races, but I think a fantastic opportunity. She's a great rider, you know, and I think that the prize money over here sometimes is, isn't great. And uh, for her to go and get experience over there and learn a lot more, I think go girl, brilliant. Mm. And that's it's a bit of a no brainer, isn't it, for the winter? Yeah. I Obviously, everyone's sort of focusing on the prize money element of it. I wonder a little bit whether some of these riders going abroad is going to be a knock-on effect of the one-meeting rule in that there's, yeah, less, there's less opportunities mm. for, for riders to, to get more rides. Um, and Do you think that'll that, last, the one-meeting rule? I, th I can't see how they can go back now. Um, I'd, be, I'd be shocked if it changed. Um, although, albeit, I think it's a rule that I'm not really sure who it benefits um it's funny you know, the the knee-jerk reaction is to say it benefits the top riders because they only mm. need to ride at one meeting but then someone raised a great point to me this summer that one of the people that was most frustrated by it was ryan moore because habitually in the summer mm -hmm. he would go to sandown on friday afternoon ride one very nice maiden for sir michael go to newmarket in the evening ride another very nice maiden for sir michael and not being able to do that so i I'm not really sure at which level they're winning. Yeah. They're, is there room for a bit of flex? Or is it just mm. too difficult? Do you just park it in the too difficult tray and say, keep the rule? I think it's like a lot of these things that once it's in, it'll be hard for them to, to turn back on. A bit like saunas? Yeah, for sure, yeah. Uh, prize money always comes up. We talk about, we bemoan the lack of prize money in this country. We don't often talk about good prize money stories. Ascot have committed to increase prize money next year. Jockey Club Racecourses have committed to increase prize money next year. Air has put a, a bucket load back on for the Scottish National to pre-pandemic levels. So there are signs that racecourses are responding here, Maddie. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, the COVID pandemic had big implications in, in that regard. So it's good to see that prize money is returning to those levels. There are still places where it can be improved, of course. Um, but I think for me, this is a slightly different point, but I'm most worried about attendances 
at the moment uh, and prize money is not necessarily going to encourage people back to race courses in the same way that it, they once were. Ah, so that's interesting. So it's a question of how race courses distribute their capital. So do you think then money, say 200 grand on the, on the um, Scottish Grand National, some of that money would be better spent improving facilities to get more people into the race course? Perhaps. I mean, it depends on the individual race course, doesn't it? And, and their setup and their scenario. Um, but I think, you know, we, we mentioned Lingfield, we mentioned the times that we're in. And I'd say in general, racing does stack up OK when it comes to ticket prices. Um, but, but it's what you get doubt, when you get in, The isn't overall it? experience, mm, yeah. I think, can definitely be improved. What do you think? Well, surely they, you know, they'll be viewing that as we're going to put better prize money on, so we're going to get better fields, better horses... And hopefully that's going to have a knock-on effect on on attendances. Um, you know, Air has always been a good track from an owner's point of view. You know, always well received by owners. How they looked uh, looked after there, and yeah, I think it's now the personally. I think the onus now is on trainers to vote with their feet and support the courses that are putting on more money and to shun those that aren't. Will you do that? A hundred percent. We did not have a runner at Newbury after the boycott last year because the prize money wasn't good enough. I think we had two runners at Newbury all year and you know, we every morning when we're making a de decision on races we weigh up the, what's on offer versus how difficult it's going to be to win and Newbury was grade A racing for grade D prize money. Well we're okay. not going to go. So, ah, that, that, so it's not simply it's not enough prize money, it's what you're getting for, for yeah, the... It's, it's, it's input output. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. How easy is the prize money to win? for what's on offer and when you're going to be asked to run against all the big trainers you know it's a fantastic track it should be a grade a track with grade a racing but if they're going to put such low prize money on we're not going to support it and it's about time more trainers took that stance because it would just force the courses into action and so you will have a look at that um qualitatively every time you, you sit down with the racing car? When we make entries and when we make declarations every day, we, we're always looking at it. And do you find it quite straightforward to figure it out? Yes, because you know, you know what level is going to be required to win a race at Newbury. You know, you know that it's going to be a competitive maiden or a competitive handicap for the level. Um, and if the money comparatively is not worth, um, not worth trying to win it, then don't bother making the entry. Right. Should we talk about the whip? Come on. For once. This is what you've been waiting for for the last two hours. The revisions have taken place to the proposed whip rules this week. Let's just boil it down and distill it for you. What was proposed was that jockeys would have to use their whip in the backhand position only, not in the forehand position. That has been changed, so jockeys can now continue to use their whip in the forehand position. The other major change is that what was proposed under the measures set out by the recommendations from the steering group that were ratified by the BHA board was that the number of strokes you were allowed in a race would remain at eight over jumps and seven on the flat. That has now been reduced under the revised measures to seven on the flat and six, um, I beg your pardon, seven over jumps and six on the flat. And the penalties have been increased over and above the increased penalties that were recommended by the steering group. So, for example, the punishment for using the whip above the shoulder height rises from a suspension of a minimum of two days to four, and penalties are doubled in Class 1 or 2 races. If you take that to its absolute uh, extent, if you go three over, for example, you will get a 20-day ban in Class 1 and 2 races. And if you go four over, that will be a 28-day ban and disqualification. So effectively the trade-off is to have your overhand back or your, your uh, forehand back, it's a, a, a strike off, even stiffer penalties and no discretion in terms of um, strikes. Lily Pynchon, what do you think? I think that this is a lot better strategy than what we had with the backhand and not a lot of people or i would say most of the lads in the weighing room were not happy with um with using the backhand um i think harry skelton harry cobden everyone that was involved um you know tom Scoo, everyone that was involved with the with with sorting this issue out has done an absolutely fantastic job 
And look, we've just got to be very careful with what we're doing and how we're riding. The onus now falls squarely on the jockeys, doesn't it? The, incre the, the responsibility now is much more on the jockeys, perhaps, than even it even if that has been, to, to abide by the rules. Yeah, 100%. You know, we we as jockeys need to take a responsibility on how we are, you know, effectively using the whip. And, uh, you know, we wanted this. We didn't want to use the backhand. We wanted it in the forehand. And we've been lucky enough to have that, you know, sorted out. And hopefully we can use this to, you know, our, our advantage and uh, not get banned. Are you happy with the trade-off? Are you happy that you've got that close now to potentially getting a 20, 28 day suspension for what some would consider to be still not that big an infringement. Are you happy to, are you happier like this? Um, yeah, I think all of us are a lot happier like this because you, I think our natural way of, of using our stick is in our forehand. Um, and we do, I think I, I do personally use it in my backhand before I use it in my forehand. And I think we are, we are all very satisfied with it, but obviously the bands are gonna be harsh. Um, and we're just going to have to look after it. So talk me through the way you would approach going for your stick at the end of a race. So uh, for me, I would always give them, I'd, I'd, I'd use it in my backhand before I used it in my forehand just to get them rolling and then, and then I, 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 I've, I personally prefer it in the forehand so I would use it in the forehand towards the end of a race. Do you think it's more impactful? Do you think you get more of a response from the horse? Um, no, I just think it's a better way of using it you know balance we've all been taught from from young age racing school and everything like that to use our whip in that way and it's a correct way of using it for me it is I feel and I think that what in terms of maintaining your body position on yes the I think so and it's easier to pull your stick through like to the other side if the one's hanging with you you can just lie it across the neck pull it through and put it in your forehand mm -hmm. and it's a lot quicker and more effective where I think in the backhand you're pulling it through and then you're you have to rearrange for me that's how I feel, but I think that this will, this this has this has been magic that this has happened because otherwise, I think there would have been a lot of uh, it would have been very very complicated. Like you know, I think I saw somebody uh, the other day g get banned for hitting it in the backhand in the wrong place. That was Sean Bowen, wasn't it? Uh, I think so. I think so yeah. uh, and, and for me, I, I I looked at it and thought, thank God that we have got it in the forehand because that could be happening. Maddie, you've seen the original proposals, you've seen the revised rules. Do you prefer either, both, neither, or would you rather this issue, as your colleague Chris Cook said earlier in the week, would just be stopped talking about? A little bit of what and Chris it was a, said. And it was a very good article, by the way. <laughs> I think we, could, I think we can all piece. relate to it for sure. I think, look, it's very easy to look at this and go, what a joke, you know, they've put these um, rules in place without consulting the jockeys properly and thoroughly enough. And I must admit, I was one of the first people to go, well, this process clearly hasn't been done correctly. But I think Harry Skelton summed it up brilliantly. And you can only really assess these rules when they're in action. Um, I think someone mentioned you've got jock some jockeys who just have shorter arms than others. And if they're using it in the forehand, then they're going to be more likely to hit the horse in the wrong place. Um, the discretion has been removed as well. So it's very black and white now, which I think the jockeys, judging from what we've heard from them, they favour because they know where their limitations are. They know how they can behave. And it's very clear. Um, and I, I, I think that although it's easy to take the view that, you know, that the PJA might not have, you know, represented the, the jockeys well enough, you know, it's hard to say whether that's the case. Um, but I think we can all agree now, uh, you know, the right conclusion uh, has, has been found uh, and we just need to make sure that this is a relationship between all parties that's going to continue to be healthy, there's going to be good feedback uh, and we can learn from it going forward. That's definitely a glass half full interpretation of what might happen over the next few weeks. <laughs> uh, Charlie, unsurprisingly, <laughs> unsurprisingly um, a very close colleague of yours has been quite vocal on this in the excellent blethering section of the Johnston Racing website. Can you sum up in two sentences roughly what his view is? Oh, well, I haven't read that yet. Have you not? <laughs> Can you tell me um, what your view is? Firstly, one main frustration I have is that, and I'm sure you have it from the inside, first time round the PGA submitted one submission on behalf of 130 jockeys. 
Well, maybe if you'd given us 130 submissions of opinion, then we wouldn't be in this situation. If there'd been better canvassing of opinion and a better, you know, information going forward to the steering group at that point, you know, I don't, I don't see how the, anyone can view this as a win for the jockeys. It just says that they didn't put forward their case properly first time round, that we've had to go back and re review it again. Um, but my greatest fear is that, you know, just we're just nibbling away at the number and we're just it's just going to yeah, go well and that's a sad reality that I'm very afraid of in the in the long term see th this was my point through nearly 18 months of the steering group philosophically was that if if as a sport we we believed and we were happy that the whip the crop the pro cush the whatever you want to call it um, was crucial for the, the best and most competitive sport and that it was a, a tool that you needed to get the best out of your horse and to make the sport as stimulating as possible within the bounds of acceptability and safety and public scrutiny, then we should stand by the number that we already have. Yeah. Now, I, I completely accept the idea that, that numbers are not the best way of calibrating responsible use of the whip, but we had a number, as you, as you said, once you're down that road, it's yeah. very hard to back out of it. Yeah. So I, I and others made a pretty strong case that the number shouldn't come down. Um, and, I, and I still believe that. That's why I don't think that the trade-off is necessarily a, a particularly sensible course of action. Because I, as I said to David Jones, who was an excellent chair of the steering group this week on, on my podcast, it, it's as though you are saying that um, a technical aspect of whip use equates to the frequency with which you use it. And I don't think the two things are in any way yeah, uh, the, equivalent. The thing I found fr most frustrating with, with what David said earlier in the week was that you know, he was very keen to press home that perception is important and that those of us that take the view that yeah. perception isn't important you know, are wrong. But is, this isn't solving that issue then, is it? Are those people that, don't, that perceive the whip to be cruel and against horse welfare are they going to be appeased by moving the number from seven to six? No. It's going to have zero effect on that perception. And, and they've done another thing that I want to... This sparked me to go back and actually look at the, the report from first time round. Um, you know, it said in 2011, there's no science. We need some science behind this. Mm. And ten years later, we still haven't got any. Um, there's no... We don't know what's more important, frequency or force. So we went for we went for force. The jockeys said we don't like force, so now we're going to go for frequency. We just yeah, there's no there's no science behind that. It's a messy process, isn't mm. it? As much as I was sort of as you say, glass half full, um, it doesn't reflect well on the sport that it's taken the current uh, route to finding a conclusion. The, you know, the, the, it's, the answer, it's a if you think thing, if you think it? the answer might be right, as it sounds like you do, and Lily's Lily's happy with the answer, it's the question of the fact that everyone's seen the working and the working doesn't look terribly satisfactory I guess. And it doesn't give people confidence in the product does it? But I think like you know, we, we sat we sat and we had meetings about the stick um, and we, we turned around to you know the, the, the uh, you know the people who are running this and said can, well, can you prove to us the science can you prove to us you know if it's more forceful in the forehand or if it is more less forceful in the backhand can you do that for us? And I don't think they got back to us. And I, and I think, as you know, somebody, as I say, who was on that steering group, that when that point of technique was introduced, and the jockeys on the, on the steering group were seemingly quite happy with this as a recommendation, it, it wasn't a rule, it was a recommendation to the board, and the board then adopted it as a rule, which they then changed. Were there any recommendations that the board didn't no, go with? and that's, the, that's a key point as well. You put forward 20 and they take 20. We could sit here, the four of us now, as our own little steering group, put forward a bunch of recommendations. It's for the board then to decide which of those recommendations yeah. they think are good and which ones they think are hogwash. I'm not trying to resolve responsibility. I'm just saying yeah. that's the process. One thing I want to ask is, obviously, we're seeing now that the penalties are, are harsher than initially suggested. Were you surprised by that, having been on that steering group? Well, I thought that the penalties such as they were proposed were were quite harsh as recommended by the group. I mean, as in correctly harsh. I think they've now got to the point where if they work, and the, it's really in the hands of the jockeys now, 
I think the jockeys have asked for, to, to take on more responsibility. Yeah. They've asked to own this issue, and I think they. I think you've been kind of given ownership of the issue. Yeah, I think look, we, we, we're going to have to work. We're going to have to work hard to, you know, use this to our best ability, and it's going to be a bit of a challenge. But I'm sure. I'm sure we'll. I'm sure we'll be fine. Yeah. But someone. Someone will go over at Cheltenham, and they will go over in a high-profile race. And it and might now, be a 20 day or a 28 day. And now the mainstream media headline is going to be 20 day ban winning the champion hurdle. Or well, not the champion hurdle because he might not need to hit that, but 20 day ban winning the Ryanair. <laughs> um, so, and so that's not going to be good for racing. Well, so my, my take on was I happy with the, with the bans as, as they were before. I think everyone agreed that harsher penalties was you know, a good thing to try and stop flagrant rule breaking in big races so it's like to stop the win at all cost mentality i'll just break the rules because it's the gold cup or the grand national or blah 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 so you'd stop that you give you give harsher penalties hence the uh, the coefficient for class one and two races that's that's pretty easy to to understand i think um i think the problem is when you get into massively high bands you're you're losing a sense of proportionality with what you else you might get banned for like mm. a non-trier or yeah you know, running and finish a circuit too early or whatever. Do you see what I, do you see what I mean? Yeah, imagine if something went wrong, you know, and it, like, like you said, you rode a circuit too early or, you know, and then you've got a whip ban. You're going to be off for a long, long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, there you are. So the, the, the onus is very much on the riders now, isn't it, Charlie? Big style, yeah. yeah and it, it just it is worrying that we're going to get headlines for all the wrong reasons at a high-profile meeting. And um, so the, the pressure really will be on the jockeys to try and avoid that at all costs. And you were against the, I presume, the timing and the bedding in period ahead of Cheltenham. I mean, that seems quite easy to understand why. Yeah, I think, um, I guess now it's, it'd be less so um, but for the Irish jockeys to ride with one style at home and then be asked to ride with another style at the most important meeting of the year. That was going to be very, very difficult for them. Um, but it's some, in some ways, whenever you bring it in, it's going to be difficult. It's going to have to come yeah. in at some point, isn't it? Um, Sadly. Okay, that was the longest. No, never mind the greatest two minutes in sport. That was the longest two minutes <laughs> in sport. Done. Watch live racing now on racingtv.com.